everyone. Welcome to this panel. I hope you, you are all doing well and enjoying this first day of the City by City online festival. My name is Filipe Cardoso. I'm a Portuguese journalist and work as editor-in-chief for the Portuguese magazine Smart Cities. And I'll be honored to be your host for the next hour. So thank you so much for attending and also many thanks to the organization for inviting me. Usually, when we think about the smart city concept, we tend to think big. We imagine sensors, connectivity, big data, data platforms, IoT, all of these elements that make a major digital transition applied to large urban areas. And this is already a reality. Many European cities are implementing this kind of solutions. But smart isn't just about high tech and it shouldn't be an exclusive phenomenon of big cities. It also has to happen in rural areas. Do you want to know why? Well, the reason is because almost 30% of the EU population lives in rural areas and another 31.6 lives in towns and suburbs. So cities are definitely important, but we mustn't ignore the rest of the territory and its inhabitants. And since digital transition is one of the priorities defined by the European Commission for the coming years, alongside with another major shift, the energy transition, we have to make sure that no one is left behind while we go through both these processes. So on this panel, we will focus on one of the many strategies that can help us to do it, creating smart rural communities. It is a way to make the, the smart city concept more inclusive and take its benefits also to those who do not live in cities. It's a way to empower these communities, create economic growth and jobs, create values from the local resources and reduce the huge gap that still persists between rural and urban areas. In the end of the day, we can all agree that smart is about people, not about technology. So by creating a network of smart rural communities, we can have a successful and useful tool for cohesion in Europe. We must use it well. And to tell us how we, do, how we should do it, we have an amazing panel of speakers who will share with us some of the work that the European Commission and the European Parliament are doing on this matter. We will also have the opportunity to get to know the projects that are creating the smart communities on the field. We will divide this session in two, in two parts with the first round of interve interventions. And after that, we'll have a 10 minute period for Q&A. So we invite you all to post your questions on the conversation windows. Uh, please tell us the name of the speaker to whom you want to address the question. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible depending on the time we have left. Um, after that, we'll have a closing uh, remarks with another two special guests. Uh, so we will start the work with our first speaker, he is um, Dr. Max Lenka, who is the head of unit of the Internet of Things in DG Connect uh, of the European Com Commission. Um, Max is also in charge of many programs under the Horizon 2020 on digital transformations, so, so uh, he knows pretty well what he, we are talking about. Uh, and he, is also, he has also participated in the preparation of the new programs under the next multi-annual financial framework. So, uh, Max, you should have something very interesting to tell us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, Philippa, thank you for the introduction. And I hope you can all hear me well. Just a few nods. Yes, okay. Just to be sure, because recently I talked against a wall and I wasn't heard, so I was just going to make sure. So let me welcome you on behalf of the European Commission and also send my regards of our Deputy Director General, Khalil Rana, who opened the meeting today, to the our two members of Parliament. We are very happy that, that you are here, Mrs. Krasa Cavallo and uh, also Mia Petra, so we are very honored by that and probably it's the right order that I speak first. I should maybe leave the European the members of the parliament to speak first, but maybe that is on purpose so I can give a bit of an introduction, which I'm trying now. Would you launch my slide please in the background? I understood that my slide would be launched. I have one slide that I wanted to share with you and I understand that would be launched. So. 
I'm, I'm responsible for digital transformation and for the Internet of Things and some digital digitizing, digitalization of industry pilots. And I'm looking in particular here to bring the digital technologies into verticals. Now, I have some sometimes very religious discussions whether smart cities, smart communities are verticals. I would agree that, that uh, smart communities and smart cities are more than a vertical and rather a collaboration framework between verticals. Yeah, so that, that I think is important. So in that sense, I think they are very important to bring the different applications together and to have a collaboration platform between this, these applications. Before I now go into a bit more detail, I would need my slide. I must say it again, otherwise I would have to share it. And I would like to, to just stress that this, is, this work that we are presenting here and the launch of the two projects, that's very good, excellent collaboration with the Director General for Agriculture and Rural. And we are jointly support, supporting these projects, not only mentally, but also financially. So half of the budget comes from some sources of DG Agri and half of the budget comes from sources from us and in the way shows the way that in digital transformation we should not be in our silos but we should work together to do the best for europe but when I, when i think about rural smart communities what i have do i have in mind we often always talk about have talked 10 years ago about living labs we have talked we are talking about smart cities we are talking now about smart communities so 10 years ago we were in the situation that we got some we got digital services in cities very disjunct disconnected from each other services that were, we were looking at that were not coordinated they were piloted we did proof of concept and the living labs were helping us to bring the citizen in and to have co-creation of those services and that led to a situation that we had providers in one city not portable nothing so so that were island solutions uh, everywhere yeah so we had this kind of island solutions now my camera was disconnected so i allow it again i'm back so we have these island solutions now we have had lots of projects and a lot of work in cities so in smart cities for the coordination of these services across different applications also the use of data in different applications, maybe we have started in some applications also to share data, but we are still in a kind of a fragmented situation there, but we got more an ecosystem of services for smart cities. Ecosystems means you can, you can bring different services together, you can have different pro providers work together, and you may even get to the situation that providers can supply their services to different cities. When I think of the past, we usually had the local providers to work for services in the city, but it's, 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 it's now more an ecosystem and we have even SMEs from one city to provide services for another city. And so we see a kind of an extension of focus of activities and that we are strongly supporting from systems to ecosystems, from design to citizen empowerment, from smart cities to communities. And that is also seen when you look at the association Open and Agile Smart Cities, they are also extending their scope for community to community. So now we are extending this concept to rural areas, to smart communities, and we put 30 million on the table in two projects that look at rural digital service platforms, that look at innovation ecosystems, at a smart village approach, and also at standards at the forefront. So we are trying to bring this together. We see that rural areas are extremely important and we see also in the COVID crisis that we have now that you can get engaged in your work from anywhere where you are. And that also includes obviously rural areas. And, and in the future also many of us may think that it's nicer if they live in rural areas and do their work from there. So I think rural areas become very important for our society in future. In order to make these smart cities, smart communities operational, I think we did one major step in the recent synchronicity project, and that is agreeing on 
the minimal interoperability mechanism. So when we have services, we have to make them make the data, the systems and services to interoperate because otherwise we will have island solutions that don't work together. Nobody will take them up because it's too cumbersome to do that. So this was developed in synchronicity, in the synchronicity large-scale pilot for cities. And we are now in, besides other things, extending that in our rural and dear rural for smart rural community. So we are expanding that concept to make it more broadly used. And I will not talk to you now about the two big, very large projects because they are here themselves. So they can do that much better than, than I can do that. But for us, that's a quite important step towards getting these minim minimal interoperability mechanisms, which are also promoted by the living.eu, living in.eu movement and to bring them to be applied more broadly and also to be broadened towards the requirements, for example, of the smart communities. So with that, I would, I'm very happy to open this session and I'm also very happy again that our MEPs are here to so support us in this endeavor. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Max, for sharing your knowledge. Um, uh, now we'll have um, a, a, a recorded message from uh, Mia Petra Kumpuvanati. Uh, she's member of the European Parliament, Parliament from Finland, um, and she's uh, very engaged in pursuing solutions for restraining climate change, building sustainable sustainable economic growth, and also securing a just transition for all Europeans. Uh, she has been done a huge amount of work in digital transition um, and that work has uh, given her the nicknames of DG MEP and Madam Romy. So uh, she was not able to be live with us, but she left a message that I uh, asked the, the support to, to put it online. Thank you. Dear audience and dear panelists, I'm happy to greet you and honored to have my greetings. Even I had to cancel very last minute. I tried to record a video as fresh as possible for your to participate in this very important uh, seminar. Today, a virus thousands times smaller than a grain of sand has outlined how we all need digital connectivity daily, whether it's been our work, uh, school, and a lot of services we have managed a little bit better than we could have without digital tools. So the connectivity uh, is an important uh, strategy that we really have to follow the steps taken uh, also in the European Union. And it does not mean the cities only, but also the rural region. Every citizen should have the right for the connectivity. But let me start by saying something from the country I know best, like Finland. So it's an example of the society that used to be far from everything and isolated in wilderness without the wealth of the national resources. Back in the 19th century, Finland truly was a periphery and even uh, Russian Char showed the unpopularity sending somebody so far as to Helsinki. So we were far. But then I think the technology came in and as uh, an example, the uh, famous telephone by Alexander Graham's Bells was something that was introduced to my home city only a few decades after the first ever railway connection was introduced. So nowadays I do still think that which is more important, a physical connection or digital connection when you think of establishing a company or your home and I think they both matter a lot. So uh, after some 150 years of steady linear development, uh, big steps have been taken. And then the, uh, in the 1990s already in Finland, the um, cellular telephone became more popular than regular telephones. Nokia was at the time really connecting uh, people and at the same time the internet was really becoming a global phenomena. We know now they have changed and then more is to happen. Uh, at the turn of the century, uh, we all already have uh, now, when I speak, 
play couples in the century. As I speak today, 99% uh, of my country, Finland, is covered by 4G. Finns are champions of using mobile data. One reason is, is uh, of course, the uh, knowledge and education, but then also the uh, telco companies have been offering subscription that are unlimited with the usage of data with the comp uh, competitive prices. So we need not only the technical solution, but the right markets and then the users uh, ability and knowledge to use them. And all this we have tackled in the European Union during the last years and we will continue. Now the popular word being, of course, the 5G coverage and uh, usage of AI, for example. So uh, digitalization goes faster and faster. When we look at the uh, regulations, we know that the amount of data will be uh, increasing a lot. So we are in the beginning of path. We are not somewhere that this is the digitalization. This has happened, but we need uh, to develop the world for this 98% of the data that is not used yet but it will be in use in 2030. On the other way, we can say that when we look back in 2030, the years we are now regulating and, and adapting us to the future digitalization, uh, then we need to see that only few percent of the data available then was used now. So the, the game is not over. We are in the beginning of the path. So how to make Europe to succeed and, and, and really uh, create new jobs, better innovations, new services for citizens and companies to flourish, uh, what we need to do. So we have to en enable the flow of data to be used, for example, for the AI, but for the other services, public real-time uh, online services and many other innovations. We have been lacking behind the, the usage of the personal data that has been uh, known, uh, dominated by the uh, US and even some Chinese companies. But then on the industry, we are the leading one in Europe and we have to uh, take this uh, seriously so we can lead there. And we also need infrastructure and wider uh, data and ICT ecosystems. Uh, this has been a core for the European Union uh, on the uh, long term already, uh, and we just have to speed up. The connectivity and infrastructure need to be covering every single region in Europe, and it's not enough anymore today to be dependent on the 3G, for example, even your mobile phones, because then you lose the possibility for the smartness. And, and for the uh, schools, working places, industrial sites, uh, innovation hubs, they are not only to exist in the cities, but in the countryside where you have, for example, industry or even farming today, you need a very good connectivity and, and speeds that you only can reach by 40, uh, 5G soon, even 6G uh, is on the pipeline to come. Uh, and then the uh, backbone or uh, even direct uh, optical fiber technology is very important. Uh, this is also supported by many national schemes and then uh, European Union will also see this a way for the recovery and resilience. Uh, and then I just remind the fact we all know that 20% of, uh, of this 750 uh, billion uh, euros investments will be dedicated to the connectivity and, and for the digitalization. So there is not only talks this time, also money to make these steps for the sustainable growth. But all uh, is not about the technology only, we need the skills and further research. So the boosted European innovations and research, we need uh, funding and there are more funding dedicated to the digital research in Digital Europe and Horizon Europe programs. Uh, and I also see the important role for the education of the software engineering as every sector will get digitalized. So we need people with the knowledge uh, how to program, how to, to, to change the world for the good values that are Europeans uh, values and still develop the different sectors to participate 
to mention the health, for example. Uh, we cannot say that uh, we will still stick to the old centuries, but then use the digitalization with the respect of the uh, patients and, and our citizens' privacy uh, in the uh, core question when we do legislation in the European level and hopefully on the national level too. So um, for me, my group SND and for the parliament also, we have called the clear priority to avoid the digital gaps. Commission has calculated that the current connectivity targets, uh, there was a funding cap of uh, 155 billion, so we, uh, which was mainly due to the fiber bias. And then also that is very important for the 5G backbone to get the fiber backbone as close to citizens and, and users as possible, even the last mile, which can to be covered by the mobile applications. We don't get the best out of the Europe if some people or some regions are left behind and then also the providing of the different services cannot cover the whole potential and then on, on the business side also you cannot count all the Europeans as your possible clients if some are lag, lagging behind on the connectivity uh, and then the connections. Uh, I think it fits here that we can say that I uh, think global, act local. So, combating climate change, finding new innovations to keep rural areas on, on board doesn't wait us to solve COVID pandemic first, nor perfect economic situation ever exist. Uh, I've been a city council member over 20 years and I truly know that real actions can be planned on the national or EU level, but the real action is made on the local level in the municipalities and cities. So we, if we do not get the local action on board for the digitalization uh, and the climate change, uh, we will not success. And these two will even go hand in hand. So uh, cities and municipalities the, are the real driver that will make the difference also in the digitalization and the uses of the different kind of uh, possibilities. And we need to support this uh, development from the EU and national level that all the regions and, and uh, uh, cities, municipalities are taking on board. So the COVID-19 situation has really just emphasized something that we knew beforehand. The need for the physical infrastructure and digital tools are very important, but also uh, we need a culture for using the technologies with the uh, repossess. Uh, is there data available and technology to, to uh, do it? We also need the policy of sharing the information, sharing the data, and then knowing the right ways to do it legally and respecting, for example, the privacy. So the culture is a very important part here as well. So a resilient and robust digitalization for Europe is possible if we pay our cut correctly. We are acting on every level to uh, cover to every corner in Europe. Have a very good seminar and, and hopefully I can get feedback from your uh, good seminar to my further work. I will uh, work for uh, many files the uh, Commission uh, has provided and there will be a lot of uh, points that we can also uh, work in the Parliament to close the digital gap if we do it with you, the local actors. Thank you and have a good seminar. Now we thank Mia Petra Kumpulanatri uh, to for the message. Um, she, of course, she won't be able to answer the questions. Any questions? But don't be shy. Tell us who. What do you want to know? Uh, we will now um, go into uh, the projects. Uh, two big projects they are starting and they are financed by the Horizon 2020, um, and they are creating uh, rural communities, smart rural communities um, uh, in the European uh, territory. Uh, we will start with George Gonzalez Olala. He will present us the project D-Rural. Uh, he is the director of PIC Biomed, a Spanish association that promotes digital health across Europe. Um, so, Georgia, please tell us uh, what uh, will the project you will uh, do for uh, 
rural communities. Thank you very much, Philippa. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot uh, put my camera on. I decided not to work today in any case. I just want you to remember one thing about the Dear Rural Project, okay, which is the, the line that is on top of the slide. We plan to be the marketplace for services in rural areas. That's the only thing that you need to remember about Dear Rural at this stage. We are obviously starting this month and it will take uh, more than 36 months to, to finish. But I just want to make sure that everybody understands the concept of what we want to do in case there are some potential synergies in the future. I guess that everybody understands the word marketplace. We, you can see a hint of what it means in the, in the logo behind, behind the word. And perhaps what is not so clear is what we mean by services. By services, we mean everything that is not a product. So everything that cannot be delivered by, um, in a box to your house is for us a service. It can be from yoga classes, uh, from the food uh, made by a cook, by a taxi ride, whatever. That is a, a service that, uh, especially in rural areas where there is a lot of uh, long distances, that, that we want to be the place where offer and demand match, where um, service um, uh, organizations and, and especially small ones and even solo companies, they, they can publish their services and engage with customers, with users that they want to take a benefit from those services. So we want to be that um, middleman that connects offer with demand. And the, uh, we want to, to make our technology, our solution, very focused for the needs and the characteristics of rural areas, okay? So D comes from digital and rural comes for itself, okay? And together is D rural. We are going to create this, uh, this uh, platform, this marketplace, and we are going to test it initially in four uh, countries in our, uh, that are in our consortium. Those are uh, Spain, where we are also located as, as Tibiomet, then the, the Netherlands, Croatia, and Sweden. In each of these uh, countries, in each of these regions, we have an, a number of uh, stakeholders, mainly service providers, but also uh, what we call, and we'll talk about that later, a promoter that will be the person, the organization in charge of making this uh, marketplace, this local marketplace, survive the, pro the project. One thing that is critical for us is sustainability. We want this to work after the European Commission funding, uh, after it, it, it finishes the, the, the money finishes, we want to make this sustainable and so that it delivers value and it delivers impact in the rural areas. For that, what we are going to do is that we are going, ecosystems are very important at regional and national level so that we understand what are the needs of the end users and the service uh, providers. And so that, that in collaboration with the ICT partners, with the, the techies, we are going to create a rural marketplace engine, so to say. That engine is going to be common to all the locations, but each of them will instantiate it with their own brand, with their own local language, obviously, and with their own preferences, so that it accommodates to the, um, to the local environment. As I said, exploitation and sustainability is critical for us. That means for every instance, it's going to be a local promoter that is in charge of making this a sustainable uh, initiative, a sustainable business after Project N. This local promoter is kind of an orchestra director that is going to support the deployment of the marketplace. For that, we have uh, we will start with service providers, especially to gain mass, uh, to get uh, traction, to gain uh, critical mass. We will start uh, with uh, public health providers, health and care, actually. We are going to start with municipality, and then in each of the uh, regions, there are other uh, local service providers. We call them native service providers because there are big organizations where we are going to put their services through the marketplace. And then we are going to start recruiting a small guys, okay, the small fish, the, 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 the solo entrepreneurs, the small companies and so that they don't have the capabilities to build this infrastructure for themselves, nor they have muscle to attract a large number of uh, end users or potential customers. And we are going to offer the marketplace as a show window for the potential customers. For that, 
we have uh, cascade funding in order to to encourage them to join and not only and we have cascade funding not only for the people the communities in these uh, four regions but also to attract other regions across europe and hopefully there are people in other regions apart from this the ones that are signaling in the map that could be interested in the concept uh, we will be launching a, a call to pay uh, promoters in those regions so that they can embrace the technology and launch the the uh, the business in their own countries, in their own regions. Okay. Of course, the, here, as uh, you know, you're familiar with the concept of uh, marketplace. The key here is to have enough service providers so that we have a critical mass that attracts end users. And the more end users, the more service providers will be attracted till we get into um, uh, a circle that uh, leverages over time and is, is, is balanced the users and the service providers for the benefit of everybody. And that's it. I mean, we plan, again, uh, something very critical for us is community building. Something very critical for us is exploitation and sustainability. And for that, communication and dissemination is going to be very strong. We already have the web page. It's just basically a landing up and running. And I encourage you to, to visit that web page and contact us and follow us because we will be delivering news and updates uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giorgio, such an interesting project. Uh, we will now hear from Marcus Antonio Nogueira, um, who is my compatriot. Uh, he is the coordinator of the Aurora project, um, which uh, is coordinated by the Portuguese region of Alentejo. Um, very wonderful uh, region. If you haven't been there, please uh, uh, visit. Um, Marcus has a lot of experience in developing projects for in numerous cities and regions, uh, and he is also now the uh, he also represents the Alentejo region in Brussels. Uh, so, Marcus, tell us uh, what does it, what does it mean the Aurora project for Alentejo? Uh, thank you, Filipe. Uh, thank you for your words about my region. Uh, Aurora doesn't only mean change and future for all interests, but for all Europe. Uh, thank you for your introduction to the session because you did part of my presentation because indeed you, you so well suggested the topics. Uh, Philippe is the director of one of the best magazines in Europe for smart cities. So that's, that's wonderful work they are doing. This is a, that's a, that's a session mostly to listen to the Commission and to listen to the European Parliament. So that's very kind that we had a chance of saying a few words about Aurora. But this is essentially to tell everybody that you are welcome to, to join and welcome to be part of this adventure, welcome to, to, to work together with Aurora partners. Um, I'm going to share a few slides, but just to make it easier, it's uh, it's not very formal anyway. This is uh, um, let's see if um, okay. I hope you can uh, see the presentation. So Aurora is very much about an architecture to unify the wonderful capacities and capabilities we have in Europe on the digital sector. And indeed, we do very well at a small scale. We do, we do very well atomized. We have quite a few smart cities. We help in future with the Aurora's help to have quite a few of rural smart communities or smart communities in general. And that's, um, that's indeed a wonderful environment, but we are missing it. There is a gap. We are missing something to bridge that gap of unifying the several solutions and indeed to, to make it work together for the good of the communities. You may ask me what a smart community is. It's a lot of things. It's everything. It's taking care of nature and people, but indeed to use the digital for that. So we are talking about agriculture. If we are on the rural areas, but we are also in small, small cities, uh, medium-sized cities, uh, villages, and so so we are talking about uh, small urban environments. So the, the services that have to be provided to people, but also a digital environment capable of uh, enhancing the economic conditions and 
to balance access, to balance access to innovation, to knowledge, to to opportunities. So those those uh, communities, regardless the geography, regardless they are located in lower or higher density areas, have the same rights to access innovation, knowledge, and and cap and, and, and capabilities. But not because not only because it's a right, but also because Europe needs that. We need we 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 are all needed, and when we say that nobody should be should be left behind, it's not because it's bad to leave people behind. No, it's because we are all needed in future. So that's why the Aurora concept is so much in line with everything the European Commission is looking to do regarding, for instance, the European Green Deal, the recovery resilience, and this. And I'm very happy to know that um, even if the proposal was written before that. We are very much in line with what the uh, European Commission President uh, Mrs. van der Leyen said in her speech for the State of the Union. So let's do a new Bauhaus for Europe and let's work together. Let's co-design solutions. And indeed, we came to the point. Because in Europe, we have wonderful small solutions, but we miss the big ones. And perhaps because our approach is different, so we are not really looking to have, again, to replicate the model of the giant from the web. No, but we, are, we, have, we miss it hardly. We miss it badly. We have to have an architecture for the solutions to work together and to make life to be smarter in communities. So that's what the RRL is about. Let's go back to the slides. So just, just very quickly, we are indeed uh trying to overcome the digital divides and that's not about geography that's about interoperability and when max Lang so said in the beginning of this session that we have to achieve in europe it's so much a priority we have to achieve in europe a, bit, a minimum basis for interoperability to make all the solutions to work together and uh, and georgia was saying about marketplaces yeah it doesn't work without that interoperability and we not, we need those marketplaces from the rural so that's that's uh, that's the the need of overcoming digital divides is not only about geography is not only about rural and urban uh, but that's that's an approach indeed to offer globally to be globally competitive on the digital sector and to make it good for people and nature and uh, so it's uh, we see very much the smart communities as the engine to make it work so on one hand we have the multi interoperability tools delivered by aurora and we have wonderful uh, partnership wonderful set of partners wonderful consortia to deliver it and that's uh, i'm i'm very proud of uh, coordinating such a consortium so that's uh, we are supposed to deliver solutions that are useful for integration and useful to produce impact and that engine bringing from the solutions to the impact are the smart communities to be supported by aurora so we have an approach centered focused on bridging bridging that interoperability gap so the key word is interoperability if we achieve that interoperability Everything that was said, for instance, by George about having uh, smaller uh, innovative companies or even individuals that are uh, developing services and tools to work together, okay, that's the way to make it possible. So bridging, bridging the interoperability gap is critical for Aurora's approach. Uh, we have some large scale pilots and some vertical pilots i'm totally i'm totally uh on on max length side this saying that we, we we shouldn't engage on a discussion of what is vertical and what is horizontal because even because every smart community is different which is very much a challenge so we have to have those common tools everywhere uh, digital environment, interoperability, minimum interoperability standards, and so to achieve that, that open digital environment. But every community is different, so every purpose uh, to use those, uh, those, uh, those capabilities and that environment are different, and it depends on a lot of factors. So 
uh, there is very much an open dialogue to the local partners and to the and to the other levels of governance in the communities and and indeed that's the challenge and that's very much the reason perhaps why Alentejo is leading because we have <clears throat> we are addressing this topic of the of the smart communities for a long time and uh, and indeed we, we we have been doing quite well on that on that sense and all the issues related for instance to the need of providing education to everybody uh, during this pandemic period so we were a bit better prepared than in other cases so that's 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 very much why uh, that's very much the understanding how to integrate in order to build that that sense of community to make it smarter with that digital environment Okay, I shouldn't take longer because it's we have much uh, more interesting things to listen to from the European Parliament and still from DG uh, Agri from the Commission. So the thing is that uh, we have a long way to do, but we have a, a, a wonderful roadmap with amazing objectives to develop together, institutionally together with the Committee of Regions. We are uh, Alentej is part of the the pilot region set in the Committee of Regions together with the Parliament, together with the Commission, because this idea of achieving the minimum interoperability environment and to achieve this digital environment for smarter communities is not a technical issue, it's something engaging everybody into the dialogue. So that's why um, uh, the last slide is not thank you, of course, I'm very thankful for to you, Philippe, and to the opportunity from the organizers, city by city organizers, to be together. And very thankful for the wonderful organization work that uh, Camilla Olchovitz did for this session. But the idea is really to be in touch and to engage on that dialogue in order to be able to provide Europe with better, uh, smarter communities and to have it really as an engine for change and to bringing technology to people and nature. So thank you so much. See you soon, I hope, in other events. Thank you so much, Marcos. Um, we have a very shy audience. We don't have any questions. Uh, so uh, we still have a few time left uh, to, to Q&A. So I would like to ask you both, Georgie and Marcos, you have very um, other experience in developing other projects in the smart cities uh, field. Uh, I wonder how different is it to develop uh, a smart city uh, project and a smart rural uh, community project? Georgi, do you want to, to tell us your experience? Right. Um, basically, for us, what is new in this project is the scale because this is a bigger budget and a bigger number of partners. We have uh, 30, 31 partners. I think that the critical change in, in our previous experience that we mainly work in, in the area of digital health is the, 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 the level of, of interaction with the community that we will need for this uh, project to succeed. Um, Multi-stakeholder, we have what we call native service providers that are basically public administration in the forum, municipality, hospitals, and so on. But also we need to have to bring together the, the different uh, entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises and the, and the solo uh, enterprises. And of course, all these need to be connected to the needs and, and wishes and expectations from the end users that can be everybody. Okay, so the level of, of, of interaction to really get what is useful and to be able to provide it in a way that is good for the potential customers together with the, the service providers is relatively new to, for us, it's a kind of a challenge, but we are very looking forward to it because that's, what, that's the thing that we adds a lot of value. We have experience in other projects, like for example, in demand, where we believe that demand driven and co-creation should be the, the way forward. At least in healthcare, we are very used to the technology push approach, which we personally think that it doesn't, doesn't work. So everything that is demand-driven and co-creation, like we plan to do it in the rural, is, is, is very aligned to our uh, philosophy, but we haven't done it at the scale that uh, the rural uh, poses as a challenge to us. Philippe, can I add some, uh, one, sing, one simple yes, comment? Course. Okay, first of all, let me agree with Georgia because it's, it works much better if this is demand driven, but that's not enough. 
we have to create an environment for the innovation to be successful. And that's that's very much a challenge sometimes in rural areas due to density. And uh, I, I'm going to answer to your point, Philippe, with a little bit of a theoretical approach. So in a, in a dense economic environment like a city, we can just insert a new service, insert an innovation. In the low density region, we have to integrate that innovation. We can't insert it because there is no critical mass for that to grow. So we have to integrate it with, with other services. On the digital side, it's, it's very easy to see. If we want to bring a new service, an innovation or a new capability or a new production line with, with more, digital, uh, more digital capabilities embodied, we need to integrate it with the existing infrastructure, for instance, and the existing capabilities, because there is not enough density for that to, to make it work, just inserting it. So this is a little bit theoretical. So that's about integration. And I got the feeling, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a responsibility we, are, we, are, we have on our shoulders, that with the, that the European Commission does very much see this idea of integration as a priority for digital. So why not to start that post, uh, post revolutionary phase of digital transformation? So we have a, we are living, we are going through a digital revolution, and we have to think what to do next after it. So the, the aftermath, the post revolutionary phase, let me say. And what to do about it? We have to integrate, and in Europe we have to integrate. So I think that's that's very important to start demonstration that, that minimum level of interoperability, and to demonstrate the, that uh, open innovation, open uh, open digital environment with rural regions. Because if it works with rural, it is going to work with cities. Of course, in cities there are other there are other challenges related to energy and so. But they are, those are more vertical. So that's very much the point that uh, that Max Lenke was. Uh, the rising that some things are vertical, some others are horizontal. In cities, they tend to be very much vertical. We can take care of energy by itself, but it doesn't work on rural areas that everything has to be integrated. So that's that's why I see that's a very good idea from the European Commission to start the challenge by demonstrating it in rural areas, even because we have cities in our rural areas. We have wonderful cities in our pilot regions inside it. So they are not metropolitan areas indeed, they are not huge, but they have nevertheless the, the, the needs of urban communities. So above all, we are working uh, all together at, equal, at, uh, at an equal, equal basis for smart communities. So uh, every city is a community, um but not every community is a city okay but that's uh, we we the concept it's much broader so uh, anyway thank you uh, just one more question um you both projects um are very uh are working in the backstage uh, but at the end of the line we have the citizen um i'd like to know what kind how can uh, european citizen the the rural uh, european citizen uh, benefit from uh, um, the rural and also from rural projects i will let uh, marcos speak now so i'm not not always speak the first <laughs> george <Marcus>. please but <laughs> no I, yeah that's uh, um as i said not uh, not uh, not every uh, not every community. It's uh, well, community is a much broader, it's much broader uh, idea. So that's the uh, every every community is uh, has may have a, a culture, may have a capability, may have a sense of uh, of sharing. That's indeed provided by the citizens. So we have to bring opportunities for citizens, and that that can't be done without uh, a proper digital environment no more there is no way back and that's in that sense we we, we indeed we we have to but this is technical we have to engage in on a dialogue with citizens indeed in in aurora we are starting it next month we are doing a, a festival related to culture and we are supporting it for we together with other projects because we have to bring citizens to the to this discussion, and they are on the front, on the front uh, side of our concerns. That's true, 
But this, um, this is uh, very much on the side of end. We, we could say that it's, an, on, it's both on the side of end use and the side of uh, propelling and, uh, and pushing for innovation because the ones developing new ideas, the ones bringing capabilities, but also the ones creating the demands, we are, they are all citizens. So the idea is to create an environment and, uh, and to operate and to operate it with a very good level of dialogue and to and to make sure that every community, regardless if it is a city or a rural area, uh, may provide citizens with opportunities and those for sure are digital. Without digital, there are no opportunities. So that's why we have such wonderful responsibility of delivering the digital, the proper digital environment for that. But George, please, you may have more things to say. Yes, in our case, it's more about uh, job creation what we want to do with the marketplace is really enable people to live and thrive in the in a rural area because they can uh, have uh, job opportunities in, in in the rural environment and that we uh, we think that if people have jobs and they they are happy living in the in the rural because they can not as in for example what we see in in some areas that they are getting empty uh, completely because people go to the cities. If we may uh, facilitate that people stick to the rural areas because they, they have a living on the rural areas, we think this is going to have an accumulative effect so that because they have jobs, they have families, they have children, and there are schools, and there are hospitals, and so on, this is, is going to enable that the rural areas, they don't get uh, capitalized by, by, by us, by people, so they, they thrive. So this is our approach, the, the one that uh, the angle that we are taking from the rural answering your question, Philippa. Okay, thank you so much. We we'll look forward to see the progress and some results from your, this uh, two initiatives. Uh, we are now heading to our closing remarks uh, and we have, as I have said earlier, two special guests. The first one, uh, Mrs. Christine Rosenau, she's head of unit research and innovation in BG Agriculture and Rural Development. And after Christian, we will have some insights from Maria de Graça Carvalho, who is member of the European Parliament. Uh, Christian, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Filipa. Can you hear me well? Yes, 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 go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, I've just been listening in to the last couple of minutes uh, of your discussion, unfortunately, uh, but I can already see that many of the things I've heard, they resonate very much uh, with, with me. Uh, so it's true that I'm in charge of research and innovation, but uh, I used to be in the Rural Development Coordination Unit, so I basically combine these uh, two areas. Uh, and it is clear that with a new reformed CUP and with a new first cross-cutting objective on modernization of the agricultural sector, which puts innovation, knowledge exchange, and their co-creation is like the key word uh, with the European Innovation Partnership, Agriculture and Rural, we work, uh, with co-creation uh, mode and methods now for seven years already and it's really yielded results and also the digitalization so these are the key areas and all the 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 specific objectives of the cup are basically oriented towards this so this is i really i think Think really important and this provides a, really a framework to pull everything together to do something meaningful in the area. So we, I would like to congratulate uh, very much the two consortia of the projects uh, O-Rural and D-Rural to their selection and the launch event. Uh, as we've heard in a previous presentation, so both projects will address uh, a really key subject, the development of digital solutions for rural areas. So from our point of view, digitalization is a key enabler for the sustainable development of rural areas. So for strengthening competitiveness, increasing quality of life, and also for decreasing disparities between urban and rural areas. So to fully harvest the potential of this, uh, for rural areas, there is more needed than the rollout of broadband. This is, of course, a key, let's say, framework condition. But on top of that, we need innovative solutions for the development of digital capacities and digital services are really crucial as well. 
So uh, we have been experimenting a while uh, with a smart village approach uh, and to this project, uh, the projects will also contribute. This is a good example how the potential of digitalization and innovation can really be used in practice. It follows the idea that rural areas and communities build on their traditional strengths and assets to develop added value. And uh, traditional networks and services are really enhanced by means of digital telecommunication technologies and also the better use for the benefit of inhabitants and businesses. Um, with the declaration, a smart and sustainable digital future for European agriculture and rural areas, most of the member states committed in 2019 to collaborate and to jointly boost digitalization in rural areas. And that's really quite important uh, to, to kind of push forward action in this area. And to achieve this objective, one important element of the declaration is the ambition to use the various EU policy instruments in a much more synergetic way. In the post-2020 period, it will be decisive that the measures under the common agricultural policy and Horizon Europe and the Digital Europe program and also other instruments are effectively used for the digitalization of rural areas. And also really to see, okay, we have so many different, uh, let's say, building blocks there, but that we kind of pull them together and that uh, we, we will have uh, some synergies out of this. This will also allow, for instance, that innovative solutions developed in RNI projects such as Auroral and DROL are transferred to and implemented in other rural regions. So, to become concrete, research and innovation will be supported under Horizon Europe, support to the testing and deployment of inno innovative digital solution is supported under the Digital Europe program, and then under the rural development pillar of the common agriculture policy report to rural communities can be provided to invest into digital innovation. So that has been tested out under other programs. So it's really about where can we test, where can we upscale and which is the best uh, way to bring all of this together. For ensuring the sustainable development of rural areas, it is important to think just beyond the next funding period. So we have the, the tendency to always think in, especially in the European environment, always in these seven year periods. But there is also a need for a bit more longer term perspective and uh, where the action is also willing to. So the need for designing a long term vision for rural areas was also underlined by President van der Leyen political guidelines. So the Commission is developing at the moment a communication on this long-term vision following a wide participatory approach. It will set out a vision for the future of rural areas within 2040 as a horizon, so you can really see that's a bit longer term. And the communication aims to create a debate at European level on the future of rural areas and the place they should have in our society. And I'm really confident that research and innovation projects, uh, like the one we discussed today, will not only contribute to building an evidence base, and to, will not only contribute to foresight analysis, but they will be uh, working in a more global sense for the development of rural areas. So the results of these will also inspire and help rural actors and thus shape the future of rural communities. So I wish the project a successful implementation and we really are looking forward because we need the results. And this is also something that I think there will be a lot of attention on this and the integration also into the policy lines. So that's what we can guarantee for, at least from our point of view. And I'm looking forward to be in contact in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're now going to our final intervention. Uh, MEP Maria de Graça Carvalho, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me well? I hope yes. Uh, first, I would like to thank the invitation uh, to thank the organizers for this opportunity to be today with you. Uh, I apologize that I only had joined in the end, but I had a, meet, uh, a meeting just uh, until now. Uh, but I'm very happy to, to be associated with uh, 
uh, your event, an event that deals with a very important subject. And I take the opportunity to congratulate the consortium of the two uh, projects. Um, uh, because the digital of digitalization of rural areas it's a very important subject for many reasons for economic reasons for social and territorial cohesion and i'm uh, quite a defender on the uh, this is the right way uh, to solve the problems of uh, the divisions between the, the, the big uh, cities and the more uh, the less developed regions uh, in, in the countryside. In the country that I, I come from, Portugal, we have a, a very um, different uh, of standards of living between the, the, the seaside where the, all the big cities are located and uh, uh, the countryside and, and it is a very narrow country about 150 kilometers but uh, we, can, we really have a, a big difference and uh, this crisis the, the COVID-19 crisis has shown that actually you have a, a better standard of living if you are outside of the, the, the big cities but you really need to have access to uh, to services, you need to have access to education, you have, uh, need to have access to health, and you need to have access to um, infrastructures, ICT infrastructures too. And if you really have uh, um, access to infrastructure, ICT infrastructures, you can work very well from there because also this crisis has shown that uh, remote work is possible and uh, it, it can be uh, uh, quite efficient. Um, so I'm particularly proud because I was the one of the rapporteurs of Horizon 2020, and I have tried to to bring um, uh, um, subjects to Horizon 2020. I was the rapporteur of the, the strategic agenda, so the the main content, the detailed content of the program, uh, and I really believe that the research and innovation and the more fast road to innovation are in the uh, frontiers between different uh, areas, in the multidisciplinary areas, where you combine um, uh, research or ICT with rural areas, you do where you do research with agriculture in agriculture subjects. So it's there that we really need to push. Um, and the, these two uh, projects are along these lines. Um, in the European Parliament, uh, as you know, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I'm, my main committee is in ITRE, so that deals with research and uh, technology. And in the internal committee meeting, in the, in the internal market uh, committee, that is the INCO, where I also deal with the digital uh, single market and in the new special committee on the artificial intelligence and digital society. So I'm very much in the core of the uh, decisions on digital and one of the uh, questions that I have been pushing is for uh, a fast development, for example, of the 5G technology that will help not only the, 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 the areas that are already developed, but that uh, uh, also will be implemented because it will be easier to be implemented in rural areas. Uh, so very much in line with what uh, you are uh, doing. Um, on, the, uh, on the future and the, uh, the, um, that starts this month, we have a new uh, a set of programs, European programs. As you know, we are starting with Horizon uh, Europe. Uh, we are very proud of what we have achieved. We managed in the European Parliament to increase the budget, the proposal that was uh, um, on the table by the Council. We managed to, to increase the, the budget, uh, not only in Horizon Europe, but also in Erasmus and Creative Europe the, the, and the Digital Europe. So the, 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 pro, the programs that we are convincing the Parliament that are the programs of the future. And myself, I'm a, um, 
a rapporteur of the European Institute of Technology that is part of Horizon to Europe and has also a, a one of the knowledge innovation communities that is dedicated to digital and questions like the ones that you are dealing in your consortium. And I'm also a rapporteur of the the partnerships that are a very important part of Horizon Europe and the first partnership that I'm dealing at the moment is exactly the high performance computing and we want the high performance computing of course they are uh, very huge uh, computers for parallel processing uh, but one of the things that I defend is that the benefits of this uh, capacity of uh, modeling uh, that this high performance computing is going to, to, to give to Europe should benefit to all, not only to uh, very select and uh, confined parts of the population. So, uh, both in the, we, we need to have a diversity, a geographical diversity of member states that are benefiting from this, but also in each member state, we need to have a diversity, a geographical diversity, not only the capitals, the big, the, 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 the big uh, cities. We really need to look at our uh, countryside of, of our rural, uh, rural areas. There are countries that have managed to, to, to already to develop very much and to have a much territorial cohesion, but it's not the case, unfortunately, to, to all the member states, as, as I told you, and I have an example of, of these questions in my own member state. Uh, so we have to, to look at the infrastructures and that is very important. We have to have a digital infrastructure covering uh, the, the European uh, territory uh, and we need skills. Um, uh, skills um, at two levels. We all know that we have a gap of skills when compared with our competitors, global competitors, US and Southeast Asia. So we need more uh, informatic engineers, specialists in, in ICT. But as important as that, or even more important as that, we need that the population in general has basic uh, ICT skills and is the way that they can use because this is the new read and writing uh, so it's like uh, until now if you don't need how to read and write you are excluded from from a lot of things in the society so to have some basic knowledge of ICT is going to be the same uh, it's already like this but more and more in the future is going to be like this so we we hope that all all the member states will do a big effort to give some basic uh, uh, capacity of ict to all the population including the rural population uh, some countries are already doing this and uh, the, we have an, an example of finland that has a, a big program and uh, we would hope that uh, the recovery plan could be uh, could be partly, uh, and it doesn't need a lot of money for that because we can use the installed capacity in our universities, in our schools to do that. Uh, that we trained with basic. Um, notions how to use the ICT, how to do it, to use it in our day-to-day -day life uh, to all our population. That is, this is a, a big challenge to Europe and uh, it could be a challenge associated to the recovery plan, to the recovery uh, uh, part of the economy. We are uh, hoping uh, to start uh, going out of this awful crisis uh, pandemic crisis and uh, one of the lessons that we have learned is that ICT has helped us a lot during this uh, period. I cannot imagine what would have been this confinement. We are entering another period of confinement in Portugal tonight at midnight for one month and I don't know how it would be the, this confinement if we could not communicate to each other through ICT. So one of the lessons is exactly we need to give uh, infrastructures, we need to give capacity, basic skills to people, and we have need to continue to 
invest in research and innovation in this area, uh, in the area of ICT itself, in all the applications, in agriculture, in health, in industry, and let's use our European money well, and this is one way to use it well to the benefit to all the Europeans. And thank you very much, congratulations, and I wish you all the best in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Maria de Graça Carvalho. Digital is indeed a transversal challenge to Europe. Uh, I had a lot of questions to, I would like to ask you, but our time is up. So thank you so much to all the speakers. Also, thank you for uh, attending this session. Uh, I hope uh, this panel has been uh, very inspiring for everyone. Please do not forget that City by City continues until Friday. So take a look at the pro program for the next few days. There are many interesting things happening and keep safe and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye, thank you. <laughs>